Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel called Zana React where I learn all things Bharat with your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view and in today's video we are going to look into what did India look like or uh, before invasions took place and this is going to be an interesting clip from the Ranveer show but before we jump into today's video please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Okay, I say let's begin. Islamic invasions. Let's talk about the story. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, why don't we begin with what happened pre-Islamic invasions in mm. India? Mm -hmm. Like in terms of what was uh, the landscape, the culture of all Indians at that point in the subcontinent and by yeah. subcontinent I also mean Pakistan I also mean Afghanistan why don't you draw out a cultural historical geographical map as mm -hmm. well as an economic map mm -hmm. as well as a um, kind of blueprint about what went wrong that these invasions became successful mm -hmm. because technically the winners of war write history mm -hmm. so we were the losers of war mm -hmm. in that period if we lost war, there was something that went wrong on our side. Mm. It's like losing a cricket game and then you go back to say that, oh, between overs 20 and 30, we didn't do this. Okay. Mm. So highlight that also because mm. it's important to study history from a, a psychological perspective mm. so that history doesn't repeat itself. Sure. That's a lot of ground you've asked me to cover. Feel free. Wherever. So <laughs> broadly speaking, uh, India had had external invasions before uh, Islam. Uh, the earliest recorded is by Alexander. Then the Hunas came in, Hans, Shakas came in, Pahlavis came in. So multiple uh, guys came, but they did not do significant damage. Mm. One. Two, they were all pre-Islamic invasions, which means the faith called Islam had not yet been born in this world. Okay. okay. All right. Uh, same geography. And, 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 and the Greek invasions began even before Christianity had begun, had taken root, even in the West. So they didn't do uh, significant damage to us due to various factors. We had extraordinary strong kingdoms and the modes of travel, climate, weather, all those Hindu Kush mountains, and then the Karakoram Pass. It was very hostile territory. The Himalayas, even today, it is still our natural fortress. All right. So on the socio-religious cultural landscape, it was a rather homogeneous uh, uh, society in one sense. You had different uh, uh, schools of which, which were the offshoots of Hindu Dharma itself, mainly the Vaidika school and second, the Buddhist school. And, you know, much later you had other uh, uh, schools like Shakta, Shaiva, Vaishnava, much later they came. So this was roughly the... Uh, Social religious landscape. Now, on the economic landscape, India was the world's largest economy. Okay, second only to China. Sometimes the equations would change roughly here and there. Now, on the political side, we were characterized by you know sweeping empires under one king. It could be it began with Chandragupta Maurya and then followed by uh Satavahanas, Guptas, all these are sweeping large empires as big as some 10 European countries. That was the size of one empire mm. ruled by one monarch. So this was roughly the political uh, uh, thing. And uh, there was cultural unity in the sense that although we, the Hindu mind, there was no non-Hindu influence in that sense by that time. So the Hindu mind had always had a sense of India's geographical borders and they were united culturally, which is still the case today. Why would someone, uh, you're familiar with Panchang, right? Almanac, Hindu calendar. Okay. Yeah. So what does it contain? It contains a list of, you know, various festivals, tithis and, you know, everything. Let's take the case of Ganesh Chaturthi. You are in Bombay. So across India, this festival is celebrated. It's different here. The importance is too much. So 
you check out the panchang what it says on ganesh chaturthi where all is it is celebrated not just in maharashtra but across india all the famous ganesha temples on this day kaun sa utsav hoga and why it is done so this shows your cultural unity in the sense of both geography space and time time as festival indicated by a day of the festival okay i'm go i will want to stop right here just a second ago if you look at ranveer he's always doing this with his hands do you guys know what that means i'm just intrigued because i've noticed it on many occasion i, I keep on for forgetting to ask you about that so it would be just really interesting to know what you what you guys know about what that means by a day of the festival space in different parts of india so this was always there in our psyche it is still there so why should i go to a tirth yatra in say ujjain ki mandir nahi hai bangalore mein hai na hmm. why should i go to ujjain or why should i go to uh, rameshwaram or why should somebody staying in jalandhar come all the way till kanchipuram hmm right why should the sari for kamakya devi temple in assam till date it goes from it is stitched in kanchipuram so which law which rule book tells you to do this which which created this system Hmm. the purohit in uh, pashupatinath temple in nepal he comes from south kanra in karnataka hmm compulsory so uh, if you next time you go there you speak to him in kannada he'll reply to you in kannada so which system created this what created this so it is the what is known as sadhana tapasya it is a long process of trial and error and you know a profound kind of evolution so this was the cultural landscape back then all right uh, political ho gaya cultural ho gaya economic ho gaya then uh, uh, what was the other thing Some, something else you asked psychological no, psychological is uh, uh, i wouldn't use that word psychological but this was how it was uh, roughly spread okay what we also did was that i don't like to use this term but since it is fashionable now i'll use it India was the greatest ex- exporter of culture. True. When our businessmen went out in caravans, they took Hindu culture with them, and wherever they went, they told stories from India, from Jataka stories, from Hito Pradesh, from Panchatantra, from Ramayana, Mahabharata, Vishnu Purana, Bhagavatam. Wherever they went. Uh, even in the middle east you see you trace the history of folklore in persia turkey middle east you will find a hindu element there so this has happened more than uh, two minimum to 2000 years ago hmm. it was a continuous exchange until you know islam cut it off this this used to be there and what is known today known as southeast asia there the influence it is an extension counter of hindu culture actually speaking hmm. what made this possible unless you have this kind of political power which is also an enlightened political power you don't need swords to go out and kill and conquer and then you know impose your culture two ways to do this right one is you know chop off and then convert or you know forcibly impose your culture on an unwilling population or you do this you have your secure borders your secure you are secure in a political kingdom uh, power you know how to defend your borders from both internal and external threats and then the culture automatically spreads itself even china till date it hates india for a reason that you know without firing a single shot without throwing a single sword india culturally conquered china a lot of chinese medicine owes to a second century ad ayurvedic text named navanitakam all right that was a rather short video that um it was interesting i wish i uh, i wish that i was a bit longer so i would understand a bit more where he was coming from i think one thing that really caught my attention was 
he emphasized the uh, the cultural unity of India across different like uh, parts of India rule, for example, even with the same ruler. And I do have a question because um, for, for me, um, I would love to know what that cultural unity really under, like represents for you guys because you have so many different states um, and even though um, y to me Europe as an European Union is very artificial like it's artificially created and I have absolutely nothing in common that the way, this is how I perceive it right I, do, I don't see or maybe I'm just way too close to this and maybe you guys would be able to spot some similarities but I have nothing in common with Italians nor Spanish nor Portuguese no uh, Fr French no Germans um, uh, English I uh, now do because I lived there for a, for a really long time or people from the north north Nordic parts of um, of Europe and do, I don't perceive that we have cultural unity only in the sense that maybe there is Christianity but maybe there, there are things that I'm not seeing and maybe you are perceiving in another, uh, another way so I would be happy to hear your points of view on that like how do, where, how do you think that you know like what do you do you personally outside looking in consider to be European, like how would you characterize and define it? Because when he talks about the cultural unity that was in India from like a very, very early on, it's interesting because that notion like that did never exist within the, I think being the concept of Christianity uh, in, in, in Europe. So I'm quite fascinating what that cultural unity actually does mean to you and how would you describe it that uh, you know everyone follows the principles of hinduism i don't know please do tell me so i think that will be it for today's video if you did enjoy it please give thumbs up <laughs> share like and subscribe to this channel and i'll see you next one until then please do take care i am sending much love Bye bye